everyone. Thank you for joining us for another recorded book discussion between the Ann Arbor District Library and the Unerased Book Club. Uh, tonight we are discussing the physics of the impossible. This is a scientific exploration into the world of phasers, force fields, teleportation, and time travel by Michu, Michu Kaku. Um, and before we get started, we can just briefly introduce introduce ourselves and give a short visual description. Um, I'm Lucy. I work at the library. I do a lot of programming for youth and adults. And um, these book discussions are one of my favorite things that I do. I am a 52 year old white woman with glasses and uh, long brown hair. I'm wearing a blue shirt with fireflies on it that you can't see. And I'm sitting in front of a wall of books. I'm Emily. I am a librarian at AADL. I uh, am newly uh, working on our adult nonfiction collection, and I do mostly events for adults. Uh, I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I have reddish brownish hair in a messy braid. I'm wearing a cream colored shirt with an orange pattern on it, and I'm sitting in front of a mostly white wall with a print of Matisse's goldfish behind me. Hi, I'm Anne. I am also an employee at the library. I work primarily out of the Westgate branch as a book processor, and I am a 46-year-old white woman, heavy set, brown hair, a little below my shoulders, and I'm wearing a green shirt. And hi, everyone. My name is Fatima Hawk. I am one of the facilitators for the Unerased Book Club, where we read and discuss Asian American literature. Um, I am a South Asian woman, uh, 37 years old with black hair pulled back. I'm wearing a white shirt with some blue leaves on them. And my background is a digital background of the earth as seen from outer space at night. So it's lots of twinkling stars and hopefully fitting for this book, which is an unusual selection for us. It is the first of its kind that we've read at the book club, which is really a more of a scientific text, but it's so connected to pop culture and things that I think uh, inspire curiosity in all of us, whether when we're younger or even as full-fledged adults. So I would love to get us started with the discussion and hear what you all thought of it. Um. Well, I'll start. I, I, I struggled with this one a little bit. Um, I had a difficult time finding a way in, um, a way to engage with it. I, I was interested in the prologue and some of the first chapters. Um, you know, honestly, like it, a lot of what he's talking about kind of lost me. And so then I just decided to sort of skip around and read the parts that were interesting to me. Um, what really helped me was listening to a podcast with him because his voice is very different and he was very enthusiastic and um he sort of realized like the he's he's funny you know he's he's personable um and I think you get some of that in the book I just um I, f I it was different than anything I read and I didn't understand a lot of it and I and that frustrated me I understand that. I also um, had a harder time with this one, partially because of, yes, occasionally he gets, which to people in his field, I'm sure is like, here's how you explain it to a 12 year old, but to a non sciencey person, it, it got a little bit in the weeds for me sometimes for understanding. And then um, the other challenge I had with it is it's a little bit dated because it came out in 2008. Um, and so especially with reading something nonfiction and something that's speculating about what we can do in the future and what we've had going towards it, um, it was harder to decide to fully immerse in it when I wasn't sure what there were, up, what things were still true. But uh, I also did some skipping around and I found the parts that I engaged most with were the parts that had to do with the human brain. And I don't know if that just makes it more human to me or if it's, gosh, I can kind of remember back to the psychology classes I had. But so the sections uh, about 
uh, the mind reading and uh, moving things with your mind, I found uh, to be the most compelling reads. And I was surprised at how sometimes how slow the book felt reading to me and how quickly those ch chapters went, even though I think they were about the same length, just because that was where I had a latching on point. I also had a little bit of a struggle with this. I haven't really taken science classes since high school, and that was a while ago. Um, but I found that when I switched over to the audiobook, it made it easier for me simply because I wasn't letting myself get bogged down in trying to understand the nitty gritty details. Um, I found it, what I was understanding of it, I was finding really interesting and the the tie into pop, pop culture and kind of figuring out like how impossible are these impossible things um, was really interesting. I didn't realize until um, the section on robots that it was written so long ago. Um, and just the the advances in AI that we're aware of um, made it feel dated in that way. And it made me go back to the earlier sections and wonder how out of date and how much more advanced are we in these areas than where he was coming from. Um, overall, I found it really, really interesting, just challenging. I would definitely have to agree with that. I, I, It took me quite a while to read through these. I think my interest in the book and even in the selection process primarily came from the space of being a sci-fi nerd. Like I love sci-fi. So all his references to Star Trek, to like H.G. Wells or any of the other uh, references, I was like, yes, this I know. I know force fields because... Uh, I've seen them used so many times on so many TV shows and I know about parallel universes because how many episodes of TV have we gotten where there's some sort of a crossover thing, right? Um, and those are, and any time where he like went into talking about the cultural representation of these things, I was so into it. And any time when he went into the physics of it, it was much harder for me as well. Like I very much struggled, especially because as a person who's never taken a physics class, not even in um not even in high school, it was it was extremely challenging <laughs> to be like, oh, I get this. I did not. Um but like you, Emily, I think the chapters on like telepathy and uh, I think it was psychokinesis uh, with the ability to move objects by thinking about them um, and the chapters on robots, I thought like those were super interesting, um, especially because, again, it deals with the human brain, right? And and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, and I also had a lot of questions around like, well, where are we now with this? Because uh, you're right, it is from 2008. And that was a concern picking a science read from 2008 um, because we're like, well, where's it gonna go? Um, but I was still very curious at the way he approached these topics because I think he worked really hard to make it as approachable as possible by tying it into pop culture. I also love how it um, is talking about how we can do impossible things. Mm -hmm. So like taking that step back when I was reading it and I was thinking like, well, what, how, what discussion points uh, can come out of this? Because that's sometimes harder to do with something that is less narrative. Uh, but it just made me think about, you know, that's a theme in in novels too. The idea of something that you think is impossible that through strength of character or through uh, increased research and knowledge and figuring things out and piecing together things, um, it's it's neat to read about that being a possibility in in science and engineering and technology in the same way that it is with you know the triumphs of the human spirit. Uh, and I, I liked thinking about what would this book look like 
if they wrote it now? And what would this book look like if they wrote it in 75 years? And what what things would we think of as impossible now that maybe we'll be pretty close to later? Yeah, I uh, I was honestly laughing anytime, like somebody rather famous, you know, like either it was like Einstein or like some other famous physician or uh, not physician, but physicist uh, would say something like, oh, that's impossible. And then we, of course, know that it definitely was not impossible. Um, and I also appreciated his categories of impossibilities, right, that these are class one being they don't violate the laws of physics and it could be possible in the next century and class two being it's like at the edge of our understanding but it's something we can probably figure out in the next millennia or you know in millions of years and class three is like it just violates the laws of physics and it is <laughs> who knows right maybe um Maybe, but that's assuming we would have to completely shift our understanding of the physical universe. So, so I appreciated like having those time frames to situate a lot of this and to contextualize it. Yeah, in the podcast that I listen to, he talks about that as like what is possible, what is plausible, what is impossible, and I think that um, and and that was actually a more recent podcast there were a lot to choose from like I don't know if anyone looked at his website at all but he is on tv fox news a lot like all the time um but anyway I really like the idea of it's kind of like what you were saying Emily but that like something really isn't impossible if there is no science that proves that that it's impossible Mm -hmm. like that once you kind of get your brain around that you're like whoa that's that's pretty cool, you know? And then, then you think about like all the advances that have been made um, in technology and science, someone was acting on that principle. So whether or not it was from 2008 or now, it's like, those are the, th- that's the thinking that still gets people propelled. Yeah. yeah and like you were saying, Emily, um, thinking about what it would be like if it were written now or in 75 years, it's also interesting to think of what it would have been like if it had been written 100 or 150 years ago, because a lot of the things that are in class one or two may have been considered in class three just because of where our understanding was. So thinking about are any of those things in class three going to be a millennia from now? considered in the realm of possibility yeah um but when you were reading were there things uh where even though he labeled it as class one or class two that you were like no I don't believe this is a possibility that he did not convince you I mean I feel like I just don't know enough so I'm like, well, if he says so, he's he's the expert. I'm not going to go start spreading the news that this is going to be happening. Um, but there are certainly, I mean, even his class class one impossibilities still seemed, a lot of them pretty impossible. Uh, but I think the one is kind of the opposite of the question that you were asking. But I sort of started uh, with the telekinesis chapter being like, yeah, sure, man. Like I, I read Matilda, I loved it, but I, <laughs> I don't see this happening. Uh, but when he was talking about how they've already kind of figured out ways so that folks who are quadriplegic can still use their brains to communicate very basic messages. I was like, oh gosh, well, and if this is where we were in 2006, like you're, you're convincing me, um, which was exciting and being convinced and being able to go along for that ride, I think was another reason why I felt more propelled through those chapters because I, not that I could really follow the science, but I felt like I could follow it a little more when I could see concrete examples about how it's impacting people's lives. Uh, And so, yeah, it would be really interesting to listen to him talk about this. Like, I think, Lucy, that was wise of you to go track down some podcasts, because I think that in that enthusiasm and the like, 
having an audience, like a specific person he's talking to, whether it's the audience of listeners or the person who's interviewing him, I think that maybe helps keep everything more within uh, within grasp. Yeah. Yeah. And he has super interesting, like, he talks a little bit about his childhood um, in the beginning of this book, but like his parents, um, he didn't grow up with much at all. His parents were in the internment camps, even though they were born in this country. And, um, you know, he talks about building that atom smasher in his garage. And then what really happened is he won some national science fair and Edward Teller, um, you know, who's like, created the atom bomb uh or had a hand in that said wow if you can get into harvard i'll fund your way there so i mean like those kind of brushes with people are pretty cool yeah and he he when i heard him speaking he tells those stories really well and he's um he's so he's very engaging and very easy to listen to I think I, um, the, for example, the telepathy or um, the psycho, uh, psychokinesis, for those chapters, I doubted, because I think the way that my mind always, like, thought of it was like, oh, it's something that humans, like, either evolve to on their own, and so, therefore, they can be mind readers, and therefore, they can move objects. I've never applied it to this idea of, like, the hybrid with technology, right? Like, that with a tech assist, they can do it, and when he describes it that way, of course, like, that suddenly made a lot of sense to me, and I was like, oh, yeah, I, I see that, and I know that we've made a lot of progress, whether with like um, uh, the quadriplegic example, but also just like some of the other uh, limbs and, you know, um, wearable technology that helps you do things that you might not otherwise do. Yeah. So for me, that impossibility probably... Um, probably started to seem a little more real, but still not in that we're going to evolve to it stage. Yeah. I did I wonder, so oh, weird. sorry, go ahead. I, I was, I, go ahead. <laughs> okay, mine's quick, uh, which is just that I think it was so wise and per perhaps this is how you, you know, pitched and sold your book, uh, but that he used such approachable pop culture references to describe what you mean, uh, because even I am not a sci-fi person. Um, and yet most of his examples were things that through pop culture, you just kind of gain through osmosis. And so I could picture what he was talking about. Um, and I love, I, one of the neat parts of my job here is I get to do a thing called Nerd Night, uh, which is people, well-informed people giving talks about their background. And while they aren't all science, a whole lot of them are. So I I frequently get to watch really smart people take something I could never understand and then break it down in 15 minutes so that an audience of adults can follow along. And the most successful ones who grab those audience are by using those pop culture references that that people know and to know when you've been going too long in the science and you need to bring that pop culture back. Uh, and I thought that by breaking the chapters down into various sections and not every new section had a new, and this is like this thing that you've seen in movies or in literature. Every time that he did that, I felt like I was getting pulled back in. Uh, and I, you know, what, what a good trick for lack of a better word to teach non-science folks science well i was impressed with his like the range of of references that he used i mean pop culture yes but also like shakespeare um you know he talks about things in the bible he goes back to ancient cultures he so like i i really was impressed with his knowledge outside of of science as well um and yeah like you were saying emily those were just it, I, I like I think a lot of times you think oh this is going to be influenced by science fiction because he talks about science fiction in the beginning but he ranged so far from science fiction um that you know I think that just kept it interesting 
Actually, I was wondering about that. Um, I was like, did he have TAs or other people do a lot of like, or like research assistants help him with this research? Because um, I remember as an undergraduate student, I did a research assistantship with um, like a media studies professor. And I had to pull all these references for men and masculinity on television, like primetime television. That was the topic. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I had to pull all these random examples and things. And, um, and so I was wondering, like, how many people did you have helping you with this? Because this is, or maybe he is just that widely, you know, read and knowledgeable person. Um, I mean, uh, both are probably true. But yeah, I was just like, wow, this, that's really cool especially some of the stories from the Bible, because I was not prepared for that. So complete shifting of topics, but one of the chapters that I found really interesting, and it's because I didn't realize we had gotten this far with the technology, and that was in 2008 or a little before, whenever he happened to be writing it, was teleportation. Um, and the idea that we have already teleported a molecule across the room just was fascinating to me because in my mind, that's one of those things that is truly just science fiction and not based in reality at all, but it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was surprised by that too. And that one was one of the ones I wanted to follow up on and be like, where are we with teleportation now? Yeah. I thought the robots chapter was interesting because even like calling them robots, um, but reminded me of one of the stories we read in that um, Ted Chang collection where like the AI becomes so, these people spend this like long-term study with their AI, you know, um, beings so they they start to worry about them like people and you know and he's sort of beginning to talk about that there and then when I was listening to this podcast he was talking about the idea that like well if it talks like a human and it thinks like a human why is it not a human you know like and you're kind of like what but and then he keeps going and you're like well maybe I don't know but you know it's just it's um it was interesting to to read something that obviously was dated and we know more because it's talked about all the time, but to see, um, it just to follow that like evolution. Yeah, absolutely. I've been playing around with um, like the chat GPT or the University of Michigan's version of it and asking it questions because I'm really curious about the various uses. And one of the questions I recently asked was, how do you tell your roommate they need to clean the bathroom? And this is a question that my students often pose to me. It's like, this is the, one of the core conflicts that comes up for students learning to live together with other people for the first time. And so I was so impressed with like all of the suggestions, like, and uh, even words like you can do it kindly and directly and this is how you might and you might say this you might say that um and i was just like this is so helpful right it is within seconds mimicking language um and 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 so when he's talking about how much struggle it is for these robots to put sentences together or to recognize things. And I'm now thinking about your, the little Roombas and, <laughs> and, um, and chat GPT. It's wild. It's really interesting to think about the uses of that too. Um, in between libraries, I did a small stint in senior living. And so I went to a conference in 2018 and there was a, tech company who was showing something that they were working on and it was still a prototype, but it was essentially like your robot companion. And the idea was that it would help to combat the loneliness epidemic, particularly as we have, we have so many more people who need care than we have caregivers. And so as the more tightly squished that gets, the more that your human caregivers, you lose 
like the extra, the non-physical care, the connection. Um, and I thought it was so fascinating. They talked about how, you know, you can feed in your interests and they can refer to the internet and you can share family pictures and it can pull things up. And I thought this was so neat. And so I went back to the uh, senior community that I lived at and I was telling my residents about it, expecting them to be as like, interested. And to all of them, they, they were horrified that this was going to be the trend. Uh, and it kind of made me think about perhaps there's also a difference in the way that our generations have come to look at robots, um, just in the way that it is represented in story, whether it's books or film, uh, so much of it, especially in the, you know, the 40s and 50s were, they, they weren't exactly your friends. And while we certainly see that now still, we also see your your robot pets, your robot companions. And I think um, it's it's such a fascinating tool that can also be incredibly scary as we're seeing it kind of evolve faster than we can follow and not being able to answer why why it does something, why it says something or why it thinks something is definitely scary. But when you think about it, all of the potential problems that it can help to aid, like like your example, Fatima, of conflict resolution, especially for folks who may be just getting that suggestion of how do I put this into words nicely? <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, so I, I think it's it's, I'm still seeing it as more exciting than scary. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because I grew up in a time of robot friends. I just recently finished reading Clara and the Sun for the first time, which is essentially that concept of a robot companion and for a child. Um, the And I really appreciate it because I think it got at some of the questions that, um, that this book poses, which is, you know, um, if a robot feels emotions, then that, does that make it more human, right? Um, and I thought in Clara and the Sun, like for me, that was such a good mental juxtaposition because we see this robot kind of not only evolving with emotions, but because of her observation, she's also evolving in faith. And that, and so then it, it kind of, the, the question of faith didn't even come up in here, but I was like, well, what about faith, <laughs> you know? Um, because uh, and the rituals around it, right? So that I I was really thinking about that. Like where where is the line? How do we differentiate it? And do we well, need to be anything? Clara on the Sun, I think I cried at the end of that. Like I loved that book so much. And I was thinking, like, I am crying about, you know, someone who <laughs> it's an AI, but but she, they've become so much more than that. And that's really interesting to think about in light of like this idea of if it thinks like a human and, and she, you know, really evolves to think like a human. Um, mm -hmm. The faith piece, I think like as his later work, he really gets into the idea of like, well, the God theory and like the theory of everything. And um, he definitely, I think starts to talk about his, the, this, uh, you know, his own feelings about religion and, um, but yeah, that's that's all beyond. That's all in his later Fox News appearances. <laughs> yeah, that's a surprise. Are there any technologies mentioned in the book that you would love to see made reality? It's one of those things where when you start to learn the nitty gritty about how something may be possible, it stops being the like magic wish. Like, I don't like driving. I'd love to be able to teleport. But when you think about like the the actual logistics, I'm like, well, no, that that's never going to be what in my lifetime, what I would want it to be. Um, but it is interesting to think about. Yeah, if teleportation could be like, I want to be in a foreign country now, 
mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to wiggle my nose or whatever, and then be there. That would be great. But yeah. It could also be something like you're wanting to send a package and it gets there as soon as an email would get there instead of having to go the long way around. Oh, yeah. Talk about carb- reducing your carbon footprint. Yeah. Um, for me, it would definitely be like the faster than light technology as well as just like having, you know, spaceships. Um, but mostly because I still want to to know to be on other planets and to see see that and I don't think that's in my lifetime but who knows right so um uh yeah for me like that's my curiosity point where like if I were to have it today I would I would be on it I I would totally try it out (laughs) I think I'd be curious enough yeah yeah I feel like faster than light travel would be one of the things that would make expanding our knowledge base so much easier because we're kind of confined by what we can see from where we are or a little bit further away from where we are but that would open up the galaxy and beyond absolutely yeah um this book did make me think a lot, especially when we got to the chapters like following like extraterrestrials and UFOs and all that. Um, it made me think a lot about the TV show The Expanse because that is the most realistic take I've seen on space travel in a TV sci-fi TV show. Um, they basically haven't achieved faster than light technology and so they're limited to our solar system. And uh, um, human humanity has spread around the solar system to a lot of those moons that he talks about that that are that have water or could in some way be habitable um and so i i was thinking a lot about that while reading this because i was like yeah um in the expense universe i mean it's much further out into the future but it's still like faster than light being so far away from our understanding that it would be hard even then hundreds of years from now yeah also that is just a great show so i would recommend yeah you know thinking hearing you talk about like something that's farther in the future i think i'm kind of identifying one of the things that i did struggle with with this book um was that I think we've come to a point like it's hard to balance what you hear in the real world and then you dive into a book like that because I feel like it's the future like the you know hundreds of years from now future is so um you know fragile right now basically it's like it's it's in the balance is it and so um as much as he's saying these things are possible, it's like, well, possible if, you know, and Mm -hmm. I I couldn't get that out of my mind some of the time. But I I think, you know, I I kept like brushing up against where we are now versus where he was when he was writing that book. That's really a downer, but you know. No, No, absolutely. I mean, 2008, it was like around the time when we were getting, I mean, Blackberries were out, right? But not like the really fancy iPhones. You know, most people were still using like the little Nokias. So to think about just the fact that we have full-fledged computers in our hand, um, I think that's also extreme. And so I think I I thought a lot about like how much technology I've seen in the course of my life, lifetime already from growing up with landlines and to now like and, and dial up internet when we finally got it to now having such fast internet anywhere, anytime, all the time. Um 
and having easy access to so many things. And that's just one, one form of technology. So I, yeah, I, it's hard for me to imagine the future, not because of what you said, Lucy, of like the existence of it, but more because it's going so fast that it feels hard to predict for me because it's going too fast. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a robot when I was little named 2XL or X2L, I can't remember. And you put an eight track, that's how old I am, into his like belly. And he said, thank you for turning me on. And then you could like ask him questions, which were already pre-programmed into the eight track. Um, yeah. Wow. And still think about him. So, yeah. <laughs> but we've come a long way from that. Yeah. Mm. That's fun to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the acceleration of technological developments. Um, and I think because of the general length of a human life, it feels like, say, Newton was millennia ago and it's just not and so how far our understanding has come in a relatively tiny period of time and the fact that it is kind of gaining speed as we go just is mind-boggling to me mm -hmm. yeah but for that same thing, it gives me a little bit of hope with what uh, Lucy is talking about that maybe we can technologically dig our way out of the hole that we have created for ourselves. Mm. What are some of the concerns or worries that you share? With, with like or that you feel about technological advancement I mean maybe it's the librarian in me but the, the fact of how easy it is to make something that is not true appear true so whether you're talking about like the deep fake video uh or the the convoluted ways of sourcing it used to be a lot easier to sniff out when something was inaccurate and so you know the internet is amazing the internet is terrifying uh and there are harder way it is not easy to tell people here's how you determine whether something is real or not um and that's that's scary um because it's so so easy to be tricked and it is so easy to be taken for a ride and to go down into rabbit holes and I only see that getting worse and not better and that's terrifying yes yeah I am um, I get concerned with technology and the advancements in technology where it when it runs against runs up against like hubris basically and kind of the connection between money and power and technology you know um like if you're using if you're a physicist and you're trying to figure things out for a practical application that can help people like you're relying on funding and um but if you're someone who it just is a billionaire you can have access to technology and then just you know do things like shoot a rock into space or you know and so it's it's um it's just an interest it's interesting to see like these conflicting these different stories you get it, like if you look at the news you know it's like this really rich billionaire did this built this thing and it went off into space and did nothing and you know it seems like a waste of time and money and and resources and also like what's the what's the cost to the climate and then like 
on the other hand, all of this technology is can be used for the good of of people and can be really helpful and have applications in you know um, in like helping poverty and helping um, medicine and all these things. So it's it's um, I don't know. It's just I think it's an interesting conflict, but I. I get frustrated, I guess is what I'm saying, by the the connection between what I think of as like this hubris. Like there's no place that we can't go or send something. And um that concerns me if, if it continues to just be fed in that direction. I think for me it's all of those things for sure and I think one of my biggest uh, fears is misuse obviously of technology right so um I use TikTok and I can't tell you the number of videos I see about people like searching for cameras while staying in Airbnbs or hotels like these are trips and tricks to or buy this thing that'll kind of, you can use it as a detector to see if there are any cameras in the room. And to me, that terrifies me, right? In a, like, it's a very small example, but it's, it's like, we've gotten so good. We've built cameras that can be hidden just about anywhere. And we've gotten so good at it that our privacy can be invaded. I mean, our privacy is being invaded in lots of different ways, but this that particularly feels really horrific. Um, and so so things like that, I actually spend a lot of time thinking about because I'm like, oh, wait, no, this, this is hard. And then also the human, um, the impact on humans. So like I haven't bought a new phone in a long time and partly because I know that it's materials for it is being mined by children and other things like that and I'm like I have to reduce my like I have to push back against this idea of you should get a new phone every couple of years kind of thing because the technology whatever the case may be and think about that as well um, but all of that is just terrifying to me and I don't think that we have policies or rules or regulations that can like really help um and i think that's gonna have to be the next thing uh it should already be a thing and i think some places are doing better than others like europe for example but um but it's something that we in the u.s have to do better at so that definitely worries me at least part of that comes just from us having uh, people making policy who don't understand any of it. Um, and so the, the knowledge there is so far behind what's actually possible that by the time some policy is set, they're solving a problem from 20 years ago and we've moved so far beyond that, that we're still not addressing whatever the core problem is. Yes, definitely. Are there things that you're really optimistic about? Technological advancements, I mean. I mean, in general, I think the advances in medicine, but this it wasn't something that was discussed too much in this book, but I will say that's that's just amazes me, the amount that things have changed in my lifetime and the track that they're going in. Medicine is um, something that often has the money behind it to, and the like public interest to, to keep that moving. Uh, and keep that advancing. So I, I think I feel moderately optimistic about that. 
Yeah, I was surprised when he was talking about nanotechnology that he didn't talk about medicine too much in, in that space because I feel like there's a lot of, that's at least that's been the space I've been aware of where nanotechnology is used way more often or is being developed a lot more. Yeah, I think you touched on it very briefly in that section, but I would have liked to have seen more. I am optimistic about things that technology is, um, or things that are being developed technologically to help with climate change and environmental things like um, microbes or something that can uh, digest plastic, you know, taking care of some of these things that we've been uh, doing to the planet for so long. Um, not that we shouldn't be doing things to stop <laughs> dumping plastic everywhere, but you know, we've already done it. So as much as we can find technologies and create them that will help us undo the damage we've done, that uh, makes me optimistic. Yeah, I would say along those lines, like if technology can be used or continue to be used to like help people feed you know impoverished people or like starving people who don't have access to things if there's ways to get things people or create um you know something that is a like a better way to get nutrients to people i just think that like if if um technology can be used like to to help people and the and the climate like you're saying yeah yeah um I actually really liked it in the in the chapter where he talks about I think the the what does it he call what does he call it um psychokinesis or something um yeah psychokinesis is it like how technology has been is being used to make things more accessible for people. So I thought that was really exciting that someone can close the blinds or turn on the lights or turn on the television and change, you know, like all of those things. I thought, yeah, if I think we are all going to be disabled at some point in our life, and that is just fact and anything that can assist with keeping our independence, having some sort of having access to things and keeping our dignity would be amazing like the more you can do to help with that I think the the better it would be so I feel excited about that yeah yeah I like the idea that the um economy and kind of ethical compass of Star Trek could become <laughs> reality where you know the scarcity isn't an issue and so we aren't battling each other over things that we consider scarce mm -hmm. yeah. cool. uh we're starting to come up on the um hour so i'm curious any final thoughts on this book Well, I appreciate you giving us the challenge. Um, you know, it, it, no, I mean, honestly, like I, this was, I have to admit, like it, I, there were, I would go pick it up and I'm like, oh, this old thing. And, um, you know, but it really made me think and it, and it, and it had me going to listen to him talk, you know, and, um, and it was very interesting. And so it, it, even if it was written, you know, some years ago, like even that idea of thinking about the difference between then and now. So I do, um, I do appreciate that you, you put it in front of us. Thank you for uh, giving it a chance. I appreciate all of you reading and trudging your way through it. Um, this is definitely a book where you get, if you want to pick it up and be challenged by it, you can skip around, you could read the summary. He ends every chapter with like a, a paragraph long summary of 
here's what this thing is and here's why it's a class one, two or three impossibility. And if this is not your speed, but you still like thinking about, you know, technology, technologies, um, there's lots of fiction out there. Uh, in December of 2023, we read Ted Chiang's Exhalation. Um, I've personally read, loved um, Paper Menagerie, is it uh, by Ken Liu? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, Clara and the Sun, uh, too, and and there's so many, so many other titles of authors who just love exploring um, all of the ethics and uh, repercussions and um, opportunities of these advancements, and it's fun. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Bye. Bye.